let's move on to section 2.03 of the FY20 budget update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I will uh, do a, a brief presentation just sort of reviewing and updating the board um, on the school board's approved budget. Um, and I want to thank uh, Wyatt Shields, who's in the uh, audience this evening. Um, uh, the city manager last night was uh, successful in shepherding through the city uh, of Falls Church, which is the annual budget, which included the school board's budget, and it was adopted 7-0 um, last night by the council. So we are in a, a very good position from um, a perspective of the schools. So um, with that, I, I wanted just to start with just a reminder around what our budget approach was as we headed into this year's season. Um, and really our highest priority, and I, I think the city manager reflected on this last night as well, is really on people. Um, we really are um, a, a people-driven organization. 86% uh, of our, our money goes to people um, within the school's budget, and they are the lifeblood uh, of our organization. And we really believed as we headed into this year's budget that they needed to be our, our budget priority. Um, and looking at compensation. Additionally, because of the, the new high school that's coming online and um, the, the approach with the capital plan, um, we really felt like we wanted to try to work as best we could within budget guidance this year, uh, and we've been able to successfully do that. Um, we've been able to do it through um, some reductions and some realignments that we've been able to make this year, uh, which has allowed us to provide those employee compensation increases within um, the organic revenue growth uh, from the city. Um, and then all of that being cognizant of the fact that our student enrollment is projected to be 2,669 students next year. So it's a small growth, um, but it is growth nonetheless. Um, and we had some opportunities this year that we might not otherwise have. So again, um, 2020 projected revenue and expenditures. Um, this again, sort of on the revenue side, 82.6% um, of our revenue does come from the local transfer. And again, we thank the city council uh, and general government for their work. Uh, about 13%, 14% comes from the state, 1% from federal, um, about 1.9 comes from fee and others, and then we have a small beginning balance that we begin with each year. Um, just like in your home budget, we always like to keep a little bit of money in a beginning balance that allows us to maintain some flexibility. And then with respect to expenditures, kind of going back to the earlier comments, you know, 80, 85% of our budget is in salaries and benefits, uh, and then 13.4 is in logistics, and then 1.3% is in transfers. Again, these are slides that you've seen previously, so I won't I won't linger on them too much. Um, our request this year um, for the uh, for the budget um, was for a 2% revenue increase, which was 844,231, and to share any additional funding um, or revenue that came in following uh, the December's projections at a 50/50 uh, percentage. Um, and for FY 2020, um, that projection came in at an additional $200,000 uh, to the schools. So the revenue for 2020 uh, doesn't meet the cost of providing basic compensation increases. Um, I think everybody kind of knew that going in, that we were going to have to do some things on the backside to make it balance. Uh, and, and we were able to do that through some, again, reductions, realignments, and some one-time opportunities. Um, these realignments and reductions um, just for the good of, of the board and for the community that's listening at home are not gonna be available in 2021. We really took it down as far as we could in terms of belt tightening um, with respect to um, class size and the like, making sure that we're, we're as close as we possibly can without exceeding um, what the guidance of the school board is. Um, and again, we wanted to thank the city council for their partnership and support um, of this budget request. With respect to compensation, um, again, we are uh, providing a step for all eligible employees. That step uh, is about 2.95% on average uh, for all of our eligible employees. We also looked at a 1% um, increase in the cost of living adjustment, uh, and that was to remain competitive with the surrounding school systems. As I've indicated before, um, you know, if we just do a step, our salaries don't, our salary scale doesn't grow, so it's important to try to do both, a step and a COLA so that our cost of living adjustment um, does increase as well. Also, we looked at substitute pay, um, increasing it by two hours, uh, $2 an hour for our short and long-term substitutes. Um, and we are, like other school divisions in the Northern Virginia region, um, really facing some substitute shortages. Um, so we're hoping that this compensation um, adjustment will help attract 
we also have some strategies that we're trying to deploy uh, to bring in some more substitute, substitutes as well. Um, we did see some health rate, uh, healthcare insurance rate changes, and in this presentation, we've recognized those. Um, so, for example, we saw an increase in Kaiser at an 8.9 percent increase, and then there was an re overall reduction in our key advantage, which is the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, product of 2.7 percent. <coughs> Um, and we had uh, calculated uh, about a 10% increase overall for healthcare, so we actually were able to realize a little bit um, in that um, differential there. Uh, again, for, for everyone, that increase applies to both the employer and the employee rate, so our employees will feel the adjustment if they have uh, adopted Kaiser. Um, our employee assistance program, um, we are really excited about joining the, the general government this year. Um, to engage with the Northern Virginia Employee Assistance Co Consortium, who offers um, a really nice, robust, and low-cost employee assistance program. Uh, and it's more than just supporting through mental health services. They also offer financial, uh, financial planning assistance and services, and they also, um, I, I found out, provide um, assistance to plan travel as well. So they're really a full-service organization um, and, and that's a really great opportunity for us to join with uh, the general government. Um, the reductions in realignments, um, again, this is where we were able to find some savings this year. Um, first is in salary turnover, 185,000, uh, our post-employment benefits, 71,000, and our transitional retirement in the $44,000 range. Um, and then we get into the bigger, um, bigger position realignments where we were hoping to realize about $465,000 in savings. Um, and, and all of this was within the, main, uh, within the ability to maintain the planning factors. Um, we have realigned uh, four and a half positions. Our goal was to realign five. Um, and so we've been able to identify uh, $419,476 in savings through those realignments. It's 3.8 teachers a half a para and a point two of a support position. And we've been able to offset the difference um, through some other, other means that we'll show you here at the end. Uh, the logistics reduction that we were able to take is $100,000 and that comes from the relocation of our central office. Um, and then um, we are uh, anticipating that after it's all said and done, that we'll have about $225,000 remaining. And we are recommending uh, that we Put that in a staffing reserve uh, and the reason that we'd like to put that in the staffing reserve is because we did make so many reductions in employees um, again four and a half positions um, not in the abstract it was done through some significant calculus looking at projections but there are some numbers that are a little soft for example we don't really know what our kindergarten number is going to be uh, we have a pretty good projection of what that number is going to be but if our kindergarten projection is off and we did need to add a position, this, this position reserve would provide us the flexibility and opportunity to add that position back should we need it. So the reserve represents a fund that's equivalent to about two and a half positions, that includes salary and benefits. Um, if this money isn't needed and we recognize um, that we have the savings, um, we will be able to repurpose this uh, with um, the guidance of the school board moving forward next year. So the adjustments to the advertised budget um, here is the general government transfer. Oops. Um, we, we again uh, got a $200,000 increase from the government transfer. Uh, we, didn't re we weren't able to realize state aid as much as we thought we were going to, so we were down about $37,385. Uh, with respect to expenditures, again, we saved about $100,000 in uh, what we projected were going to be our health costs increases, so we projected um, $400,000, uh, was that, that's the right number, right? $300,000, we only ended up um, needing $200,000, so we were able to realize $100,000 that we had projected. Uh, the Employee Assistance Program is saving us almost 9000 or about $8,500 a year uh, through those position reduction savings and then staffing reserve. Um, our expenditure total is 162614 which leaves us as an ending balance of zero, um, which is where we want to be. So um, again, um, this is the approved budget summary um, that we've shown before. We have made all the adjustments on the left-hand side, which are the revenue increases, all the adjustments on the expenditure side. 
Um, and this, uh, as you may recall, both sides were off by a dollar. Now they're right aligned. Um, we're excited about that. And what ends up uh, as our overall approved um, transfer from the city council based on the budget that they adopted last night is a 2.4% increase over last year's budget. Um, so with that, um, we have a couple of budget questions that we wanted to um, go through with you tonight. But before we do that, um, any, any questions, Madam Chair? Any questions? All right. So Ms. Michael has some budget questions that she'd like to, to talk through. So first, thank you so much to Michelle Kopic, who's here this evening for all of her great work. The new budget question responses that we're posting this evening. Thank you. The first two are questions that we appreciate our partners of the general government completing on our behalf were questions 17 and 18, um, which had to do with the real estate median tax bill for city homeowners over the past 10 to 20 years um, in both nominal and adjusted dollars. And then question 18, I'm going to flip to it and I'll come right back, um, was also related to the same thing in terms of looking at a year-by-year per resident amount in the city general fund, the CIP, and the transfer to the schools. So included on question number 17 is that chart that provides each of those values for the school board. Then the other question that we answered is a question that was asked a long time ago um, by Mr. Rettinger. Um, if you remember this question from a long time ago, it was when we first started the budget process and we provided the mm -hmm. five years of financial data. Um, the question had come back saying it would be more helpful if we could get, most recently, the FY18 budget, the 18 actuals, then what was the 19 budget, our actuals to date, what we projected for the year, and then how does that compare to our 2020 proposed budget? So we created a chart that online is really little. <laughs> Um, but it looks much better on the screen. So I know right here it's small, but online you can um, zoom to see it. So what we actually did is we went back to FY17 thinking having just one more year of data may really help. So the way we presented this information is it's sorted first by revenue, then by expenditures. They're in order by object. And just for the people listening, object is the what. So the what we're getting the money for or the what we're spending the money on. So you can see on this top first line what it shows us is the what is our school bus stop violations. So that's the stop arm camera revenue on our buses. So as you're working across, what you're going to see is you'll see our FY17 budget, what was the actual revenue we received in FY17, what was that variance. So in FY17, you can see we budgeted 154000 800, I think, in terms of our stop arm camera revenue. And what we actually received was substantially smaller, $5,500. So our variance between our budget and actual was our actuals were $149,300 below our budget, right? So in terms of a budget variance, that was, you know, negative 96.4% for that year. So then if you move across, you'll see in the same data for FY18. You can see in 18, our budget was still at that same $154,800 level, but our actual revenue came in higher at $81,775. We still had that variance of $73,025, so we were, you know, 0.47 or 47.2 percent below. And then you'll see for FY19, what we've given you is the budget. What was our actual through month nine, which is our actuals through March, right? What do we project to get for the year? then that variance is the projected budget, projected actual variance. So when we think of stop arm cameras, our budget for FY19 was actually <coughs> reduced based on previous trends to $45,000. Through March, we've received $118,100. Um, we project that for the year we'll end up collecting $181,500. So our variance in this case is positive. We're going to receive, we're projecting $136,500 more dollars. So our variance then is we would have collected 303% of what we budgeted. And then you can see for FY20, we've budgeted $55,000. Stop arm cameras in this case is a good example because there's some significant volatility, I would say, in that line item. So the first page gives you revenue, and then the exact same thing repeats um, on all of the following pages for expenditures, right, starting with our school board member salaries. 
So we hope that this view will be super helpful. To get this report, we had to run two different kind of sets. Our, our actual financial system gives us the previous data, um, but to start to add in the um, budget for the next year, we had to use the budget module. Um, so this was a little bit harder to put together, but we really hope that it's helpful. Um, it was certainly helpful to the staff, so hopefully it'll be helpful to the school board and public as well. Any questions or comments? Thank you. <laughs> yes, Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what did we learn from this chart? What does it tell us? So I think it tells us a couple of things, right? Um, I, I think there are some categories that are very difficult to project, right? When I think of things like stop arm cameras, right? It's really hard when you look at this volatility to see how come, right? I would say it was because our program had been suspended pending some outcomes of some litigation, right? That program is back in full force, so our revenue is up, right? It doesn't yet show us that, you know, we now this year have gotten a lot of stop arm camera violations. You know, our hope is that that's really going to decrease people passing buses that are stopped, right? In which case that revenue should decrease. So I would say for items like this, that's not particularly helpful. But when we're starting to think about trend data, whether it's when we think of revenue, sales tax, you know, or our largest category in terms of instructional wages, I think this really does show you um, for instructional wages, it's probably about the sixth line down. You can see that we have consistently underspent. We underspent in 2017 by 2.7%, then it was up to about 4% and FY18, but we're projecting that that's going to drop way down when we get to FY19. So, so my hope is that it's really helpful in terms of where do we see predictability that we can use to help us budget better, and then where do we have greater volatility that we need to explain better. Yeah, but I guess, for example, with respect to Dr. Noonan's cost transformation, so, some of those instructional wages that those trends could be showing that you're running out of some excess, you know, some, you know, as, as seniority d drops, maybe the volatility will go away simply by the fact, by virtue of the fact there are not as many senior people. So I, I guess there may be some deeper trends in there behind the, the numbers that are worth teasing out. I, I don't, I, I don't know one way or the other. Sure, and, and I would say there are deeper trends that we need to look behind each of these things, right? When you think of a budget and actual, you know, I always say your budget is your plan and your actual is what happened, right? We don't want to get in a situation where we're processing a ton of budget transfers to try to get our actuals to align with budget because then the budget isn't a helpful tool to help us plan and think better. And then certainly as we move forward and start to make changes and adopt different practices, that's going to impact these trends. So for example, for the first time in FY 2020, we're actually budgeting to have savings from employee turnover, right, which we haven't done in the past, right? And the real goal is we want to make sure that we're spending the money the best way we can with the most planning up front, right? At the end of the year, we want to end the year with having a positive balance or having not expended all of the revenue that we've received. But we don't want that variance to be too large because th then it means we didn't fully use all the money that we could have in the beginning to meet the board and the school system's priorities, right? We waited till the end and then we made decisions with a different set of data. So I, I, I think all of this to me is that the budget is really a planning tool and it really helps us plan and think better. And, and hopefully having the data will um, improve the conversations that we're having and really thinking strategically about how we're using the resources we have. Although ultimately the biggest single budget busting factor you can't plan for, right? Yes, that is entirely true. Any other, yes, Mr. Redinger. So to further answer Mr. Castillo's question, it, along the line, as Ms. Michael said, you know, the, the thing that I like to use this sort of chart for is um, whether there's a persistent overspend or underspend in a category. Um, and it can tell you if your budgeting is accurate or not, as you suggested. Um, it, what I'm going to be really interested in seeing this for next year is does the um, reduction we took from staff turnover um, reduce or more accurately reflect our budget numbers on human capital costs. Um, and 
iteratively we can see you know what the right number is and making sure that the budget as you're suggesting Ms. Michael um, better reflects the, the place that the actual expenditures will be I haven't spent enough time with the chart already there are some fairly you know interesting places like I noted that you know private school tuition was really underspent the last couple of years but two years ago we didn't spend we, we way overspent so you know that that immediately tells me rightly or wrongly that there's some unpredictability there. You don't know what's going to come up for the year in terms of what the services are needed based on the students, and that I mean that you can't explain. But for things like human capital costs, it can be pretty useful. So um, I, I hope I hope it is as useful to uh, the school personnel going forward as I expect it to be to people like me who, in looking at the budget, like to look at line items and making sure that we're putting money in the right places. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, picking up on the last thread from um, Mr. Reiner's comment, is is it possible to have the spreadsheet itself posted online? Because then then one can dive into those lines as much as you want to, I suppose. Um, that'd be very helpful. I, I thank you because I think this is really going to be useful information. 